Hello, everyone, and welcome to Earth Climate Dreams, Depth Psychological Reflections in the Age of the Anthropocene. And I'm Bonnie Bright, and I'm the host of this particular symposium series. I'm also the founder of Depth Psychology Alliance, which many of you know is a free online community for everyone who's interested in depth and union psychologies. And you can find that at www.depthpsychologyalliance.com. And also, this topic has been very interesting to me for quite some time, and I have truly found a passion in looking at our current ecological and social crisis and being able to find depth psychological perspectives on what's happening for us. And so I'm really happy to be able to bring to you my guest for this session, who is Jerome Bernstein. Hi, Jerome. Thanks so much for being with me today. Hi. Glad to be here. Well, it's great to have you here because I have for a long time been very inspired by your work and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but particularly your book called, I have it right here actually, I'll show it to everybody, Living in the Borderland, The Evolution of Consciousness and the Challenge of Healing Trauma. So I know that many people who are watching this will probably be familiar with this book, but it really was a, a book that is life-changing for me and some of the ideas in here have been just absolutely profound. So, so grateful for your work on the topic and, and you were such an obvious choice for me when I was thinking about who might be able to provide some depth psychological reflections on this particular topic. And so we will jump into all of that. First, I just want to go ahead and read your bio, Jerome, so that everybody has a little bit more background on you. So I'll do that. So Jerome Bernstein received his bachelor's and master's degrees from George Washington University in Washington, D.C., where he was born and lived until he moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico in 1992. And he began his professional career in D.C., working with several nonprofit educational and training organizations for people with mental and physical disabilities before becoming the deputy director of manpower training programs in the Federal Office of Economic Opportunity. That is a mouthful. <laughs> And, and I'm sure a wonderful opportunity to bring some of your own perspectives there. I know that was in the early days, of course. Uh, let's go on. In 1971, he, along with a business partner, founded a new social science consulting firm, RJ Associates, through which he contracted with the Navajo Nation. And that same year, Native American tribes were given the right to take over the administration of selected programs from the federal government under the Indian Self-Determination Act. And within weeks, the chairman of the Navajo Nation invited Jerome to become a consultant to assist with the development of a tribal division of education, as well as being the tribe's registered lobbyist on Capitol Hill. And this one-week consulting assignment turned into a six-year professional relationship with the Navajo tribe. And Jerome has maintained a 45-year relationship with friends and professionals and has been working to bring the wisdom of the Navajo and Western healing together in a collaborative clinical model. And I, I know I knew the story about you already, Jerome, because you had shared this in the book, of course, and, and uh, I think a lot of people probably are familiar with that. But I know that that core connection with the Navajo tribe and, and the work that you were able to do with them and, and also the, I think what has become a real friendship with some members of the Navajo Nation has been really critical in the work that you have brought forward. And so I expect that we'll talk a little bit about that and I want to launch us with a question. So I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute. I want to finish just sharing a little bit more about you. Through his contacts with the Navajo Nation and particularly Carl N. Gorman, the tribe's director of the Office Native Healing Sciences, Jerome was exposed to Navajo religion and healing. And this had a profound effect on him and he began to have healing dreams that involved Navajo and Hopi medicine men. And at the time he explored these dreams in his union analysis. And then over time, he realized that these dreams were leading him onto a new path, and he was to become a union analyst. So in 1980, he graduated from the C.G. Ewing Institute in New York, becoming a union analyst. He's been in private practice since 1974. He was the founding president of the C.G. Ewing Analysts Association of the Greater Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Area, vice president of the C.G. Ewing Institute of New York, and past president of the C.G. Ewing Institute of Santa Fe. And he's currently on the teaching facility of the C.G. Ewing Institute of Santa Fe. And uh, I just want to actually mention also that Jerome is married and has two grown sons and three grandchildren. I'm about to have a fourth. That's right, yes. Yeah. Very exciting. Congratulations. And you know, it's so interesting because this is kind of a long bio and sometimes I tend to cut them down, but there was so much in there that I thought was so relevant. And even the part about you having grown sons and grandchildren, we're living in a world right now where so much seems uncertain to me. 
and our children and our grandchildren are so much the hope of the future and, and what we're leaving them. There's been a lot of talk in certain circles, at least, about the legacy and what are we leaving to them on this planet and, and what kind of tools and understandings can we leave them as our legacy. And I know that most of us don't have answers to this kind of thing, but it just seems such a poignant sort of way to close on the circle that I just made in reading your bio that you offered between starting out working for the government in a sense to moving on to developing such relationship with the Navajo Nation and then finishing with your own children and grandchildren and and how that all comes together. So maybe let's launch into this discussion of the Anthropocene and what's going on on our planet and the topic of earth and climate and dreams and how these all go together by just Talking a little bit about your experience, you had mentioned in the bio that you had some dreams that were related to Navajo and Hopi medicine men. And so I wonder if we might use that as a starting point to begin to feel into your own perspective on what we're talking about here today. Um, when I first went out to Navajo, I didn't know what to expect. I had no experience, no history with American Native tribes, and, and I was asked to go. And so I decided to do that. And because I felt so ignorant, I did what a lot of people would do. I went to the library and got a bunch of books. And I took the first one off the stack, and, and I saw the name of the author. It's Gladys Reichard. <laughs> I looked at that and I said to myself, Reichert is not a native name. And then I was starting to open the cover and then I thought, you know, if I'm gonna learn about these cultures and these people from some white person, I'm gonna learn it from this white person. So I closed the book, took them back and went cold. And, um, and the Navajo Reservation is pretty vast. It's the size of the state of West Virginia. And I, I was there for a week. And I spent that week just running hither, thither, and yon, listening, listening. There was a lot of excitement about the idea of being able to take over government programs. And there was also a lot of panic. What do you do? And, and it's as if the government never considered the fact that nothing in tribal culture prepared them for dealing with bureaucracy, federal government budgets, all that stuff. And so I spent, spent that week listening. And, and at the end of the week, I came back to Window Rock, which is the capital of the Navajo Nation, to get my stuff and leave. It was too late to say goodbye. People there learned Western way of telling time. And when that clock hit five o'clock, everybody was gone. And it was about 6.30 when I got back, which was late. And there were three men, three or four men sitting there talking and I thought that was really odd, something important happening. So I was very quiet, gathering my stuff, didn't want to interrupt them. And one of them got up and said, we've been waiting for you. And I was quite surprised. And I said, oh, and apologized and sat down. And he said, we've been listening to you listen. We think you can hear us. We want you to come back. And that statement was a turning point in my life. It was so profound to think of somebody listening to me listen. I mean, that just turned me upside down. And I did come back. And as you noted in my bio, it turned into a six-year professional relationship. I should say the second trip back, that man who made that statement to me, as it turned out, his wife was Hopi, Hopi Indian. And the Hopi tribe, which is much smaller than the Navajo, sits right inside of 
uh, geographically inside of Mavotron. And um, so my second trip, which was in February, he invited me home to dinner where I met his wife and his kids. And, uh, and as it turned out that weekend, the Hopi tribe was having their bean dance, which is the beginning of their ceremonial year and um, a very sacred ceremony. And they invited me to go with them, which I did. And that was another <laughs> experience that I, I would say, I, I would say that in the Kiva, during that ceremony, I had the first religious experience of my life. Now, I, I had been raised an Orthodox Jew, so religion was not unfamiliar to me. I should say quasi-Orthodox. But I knew a lot about religion, and I knew a lot about Jewishness, but I had never had a religious experience. And that's a very different phenomenon. And I did in the Kiva, and I was never the same after that either. And uh, here I am 24 years later, more than that. Let's see, that was 1972. So 45 years later, here I sit in Santa Fe, New Mexico in the Southwest. So uh, what brought me out here was, was an organic process and really profound psychic, psychic experiences that open up a whole other psychic dimension to me that I didn't even know existed, let alone experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so interesting how psyche has its way with us and we can't ever begin to predict how that will unfold. Mm -hmm. Now I want to move into more of a, a topic that I have heard you talk about a lot and one that I know is very important to you. And that is the idea that a lot of our challenges have stemmed from the idea or the fact, maybe we could say, that we have really tended to in our Western modern civilization to split ourselves off from nature. So that psyche and nature are considered two different things. That um, you know, our rational thinking brain has really taken over to really to our detriment because we no longer have access to some of the immediacy and the the wisdom that is so available to us in the world that we 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 don't see that is invisible to us in our current state. I'm not sure that's exactly how you describe it. It's, it's how I see it, I guess, based on, on what I know about your work. But I wonder if you can talk about that separation, the way that you see it. And I'm certain that you saw something completely different, especially from what you just shared with us when you were working with the Navajo in the Kiva due to their way of thinking. So maybe you can talk about the difference in those the psyches and, and the, the dualism, frankly, that we tend to experience from our perspective. Well, you used the phrase how we have separated ourselves um, from that dimension of psyche that's connected to nature, which is true, we have. But I'd like to go back further than that because um, I think it's, it's fundamental in our mythology, in Western cultures, cosmological story. And, um, and all cultures have a cosmological origins story. We call ours creation, which is a power myth, creation myth. Native myths are primarily origin stories. They're, they're not creation stories per se, which are really power, power stories. So I go back to the book of Genesis, since the Bible is the foundational story, the foundational myth of Western culture and all three monotheistic religions. So it's, it's big. And if you go back to the Garden of Eden, there are Adam and Eve, and they are at one with nature. That's what the Garden of Eden is about. And, um, and they are admonished, as we all know, not to eat the fruit of the tree of 
good and evil, knowledge, which happens. And then there is the expulsion from the garden. But prior to that, the, the instant Eve takes the bite, there uh, two things happen. There's this booming voice that says, what have you done? And there is their recognition that they are naked. And prior to that moment, they didn't know they were naked. And so at that moment, reflective consciousness was born. And a consciousness that had value attached to it and projecting forward a few thousand years, we would say uh, an ethic. And they are expelled from the Garden of Eden. So, so with that expulsion, from my point of view, was the birth of what ultimately has become Western consciousness or the Western ego or the Western psyche as we know it today over these thousands of years. That was where it was born. And that's really important because that lends an evolutionary and teleological impetus to that story because it's not something they chose to do. It was something that was ordained. And, um, and interestingly, it, it often gets overlooked, but in that story, the statement is made, if you eat of the fruit of the tree, you will surely die. And of course, that's Yahweh's edict, God's edict. And interestingly, they don't die. Well, how come? And I think the how come has to do with the fact that there was an evolutionary thrust there and there was a goal to be reached. And I think we have done part of what was ordained there, i.e. developed this Western consciousness, science and technology, and all of the extraordinary brilliance of the Western mind. We've done that part. But the teleological goal has been forgotten. What was this about? And why did we need this? My view is that it was ordained that we would have this reflective consciousness so that we could turn around and meet nature on its terms in a way where we could reflect one another and have a dialogue. And I think that's where we are now. We have developed the science and the technology. We have all those books that are behind you that are wonderful and rich and brilliant and all of that. And in the doing, uh, we have set ourselves on a suicidal course, which we are now really, I need to say sometimes, becoming aware of. Sometimes we're more aware than at, than at other times. And, and it's really quite urgent, the scientists say. And I think they're right. And just right now, everybody in Santa Fe, we have the warmest weather we have ever had. And this town is all about. It's so beautiful. It's wonderful. It's really enjoyable. And when people say that, including me talking to me, I say, yeah, it is, until you think about it. And, uh, and then when I think about it, I get very uncomfortable. So, so we've, we've de developed this, this extraordinary Western mind that is very, very narrowly focused and that is phobically addicted to logic and abstraction and uh, fixed reality. We, we are very, very particular about our fixed reality. And all of that has distanced us so far from 
that kind of that oneness connection with the spirit dimension that was there in the Garden of Eden, that not only are we distant from it, but our activities kill off spirit. We become more and more distant from it. And, um, and um, Jung made that observation. It was interesting in one of his last essays before he died, he talked about a disorientation and dissociation on the part of Western civilization due, he said, specifically to scientific thought. And what he meant by that was that um, our wittedness to that, that particular kind of mind and way of thinking, and particularly measurement, that anything that could not be measured by science's ruler uh, was not real or worthy of consideration. And the real part, the word real, I think uh, is the issue with regard to the spirit dimension, because you can't see spirit, you can't measure spirit, can't do any of those things with spirit. Actually, you can see spirit through, um, through what we do and don't do and how we do it, and particularly on a subjective level, how we experience it. But from a scientific point of view, it doesn't exist. Except, <laughs> I think science keeps creeping up on spirit by calling it something else. I, I think it's very afraid of the word spirit. But it's a spirit dimension. It's through the spirit dimension that we have a connection with our ethical imperative in life. And that is what I think the expulsion from the Garden of Eden was about. Was that ethical imperative? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me, particularly to be able to look at it from what some of us might consider a mythological perspective, because the story of the Garden of Eden is one that all of us can relate to, whether you're Christian or not Christian, it, it kind of doesn't matter. It, it's in the collective. And so these are images that we can relate to. One thing that really struck me, and it goes along with your description of spirit and, and being able to see spirit or not, I remember the first time that I read your book, and I've read it many times and find something different each time that I read it. But this, again, was something that struck me so profoundly, was you were talking about the idea of a co-evolutionary process in which we have come right up to the edge of pretty much our own destruction, as you just mentioned, it's very suicidal in so many ways. And that yet there is something there, perhaps invisible to us, that is actually working with us, pulling for us, rooting for us. Uh, again, my words, but just this feeling of understanding that there is something that is working to bring us back from the brink of extinction and actually work with us together in a reciprocal way that will allow us to engage completely differently and to get in touch with that spirit. So you had sent me a quote, and I really want to read this quote because I think it, it goes so well with what you just said, and, and it's articulated so beautifully. It's from Joseph Jaworski uh, in his book, Synchronicity. And he writes, the field of the finite is all that we can see, hear, touch, remember, and describe. This field is basically what that which is manifest or tangible. The essential quality of the infinite, by contrast, is its subtlety, its intangibility. The quality is conveyed in the word spirit, whose root meaning is wind or breath. This suggests an invisible but pervasive energy to which the manifest world of the finite responds. That which is truly alive in the living being is this energy of spirit, and this is never born and never dies. So what that, yeah, I'll let you talk, but what that says to me is just, it, it articulates so exactly this force that is with us and working with us and wanting to work with us to, to encourage us to get back in touch with that connection that we've lost so, so profoundly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's to get back in touch with it. You use the word co-evolutionary, mm -hmm. uh, which is right. And, um, and we need that spirit dimension to balance the profound imbalance in 
the Western psyche. As a result of that imbalance, we have a situation where there's a real struggle around, um, we can just deal with money, money interests and energy and all of those things that contribute to global warming, which do threaten the extinction of our species. And, and if indeed our psyche, the Western psyche is dissociated, you see that dissociation where you have corporations, everything from like the tobacco companies who knowingly were pushing their product, knowing that it was killing people. Um, the energy companies, Exxon, Exxon lost a suit where they had plenty of data and research about the impact of oil on the climate. And, and there's all of that thrust. It's, it's, it's an addiction. It's, it's, it's phobic. It's phobic in that that psyche gets freaked out at the notion of spirit. It's really, then Einstein said it, he said it's spooky. That was the word Einstein used, where he was talking about the concept of entanglement in physics, where one, one object here, where you had two, two of the same substance separated, and a change in one over here would show up in one over there. And what is that about? And how do you measure that? And so forth. And Einstein called it spooky. And I think that's right. And I think that's reflective of the nature of their psyche. That's very concrete. And we can, we can talk about spirit as a concept, but not as a living living energy, which is what Jaworski is describing in that quote. And so we have an imbalanced psyche that is very concrete oriented and phobic about anything intangible. And, and that's the one that is responsible for the, really the suicidal thrust in our, uh, in our society, in our economy, and everything, justified by profits and comfort and that kind of thing. Um, so if it's one-sided, I mean, that statement, one-sided, that implies that there's another side. And what is the other side? And the other side is that other dimension that uh, that we were connected to in the Garden of Eden. So, so the first I call the Dominion Psyche, um, and Genesis is very clear about that. It says that our species will have um, dominion over everything else, over the land and the animals and fish and the sea and so forth. It's very clear cut, and we certainly behave that way. And now that we are recognizing that it is taking us to our doom, the question is, how do you, how do you counterbalance that? And a lot of people will say, a lot of politicians and some scientists, fortunately, uh, not a lot of scientists, will say, well, you know, science will do it. Yeah, we'll just fix it, we'll reverse it, so forth. And, um, and that's, that's like, uh, Jung referred to that kind of attitude as, as the dissociated part of Western psyche. So it's, it's really asking the dissociated part of our psyche to fix itself, but if it's dissociated, from that part that it needs to be connected to, how does one do that? So 
so in my work, I talk about the reciprocity psyche, which is really what I encountered in Native culture. And I want to, want to be really clear, I'm talking about psyche much more than I'm talking about culture. The cultures are very different. But for our purposes here, particularly with regard to the global warming crisis, it's psyche, it's not culture. And it's not that one is better than the other. Um, they're not. They are both codependent. And the problem is we've been cut off from part of the whole that the uh, thrust from the Garden of Eden was aimed at developing and reconnecting with. And it's the reconnection, and I'm making this gesture for a reason. It's not integration. It is not integration. There, there needs to be this space between so that there can be dialogue. And it's dialogue between two psyches that are very different characteristically. And the, the, um, the primary distinguishing differentiate differentiating uh, characteristics between the two I see as reflected in the language because Western Logos language is very rational and logical and um, and focused on abstraction and and the reciprocity psyche is very different. The language structure, well, traditional language structure, is verb dominant. Western language is noun dominant. And that fact, just the fact that, that those language, one set of languages is now noun dominant, the other verb dominant, it will take you right like this. Not, not so much in terms of content, but in terms of the way we experience reality. And that's the crucial thing. And so, for example, in the both Hopi and Navajo languages, there's no word for animal. Because we need word for animal to differentiate our own species, because we are the dominant species. But within that other sphere, there's no word for animal because we're just another animal. And, and that leads to a whole different kind of relating to the world in which we live. In Navajo, for example, there is no word for guilt. Now, if you think about that, if you reflect on that, what is a psyche and what is psychic reality absent the word guilt and that'd be a great lecture but at least to a whole nother psychic paradigm because i'm in in western way of course we we have the ten commandments which is guilt well guilt's the initial eating of the apple and the booming voice saying what have you done sin and so we have codes and all of that. But in, in the oral traditional language or, or the reciprocity psyche, it's an organic relationship on a spiritual level between, between the human, what we would say is human, and that which has been offended against and that could be another person it could be an animal it could be a tree and everything in in that realm in the realm of the of the reciprocity psyche everything is imbued with spirit everything reflects life everything is part of what is sacred in life. And so 
you can see that right now in Standing Rock, North Dakota, because what's going on there? You have the oil companies trying to build this pipeline. You have the natives who are not just trying to defend their land. Uh, they don't have title. They don't have deeds to land like we do. They have relationship to land. There are many, there are hundreds of native cultures. One thing they have in common is their relation to land, which is sacred. And so it's not just who's occupied, it's the, it's the spirit connectedness to the land itself. It is a violation, it's a desecration. And it, that is so difficult for Westerners to take in. I mean, we hear it and we think it's quaint, we think it's nice. Um, but for them, it is totally organic. I mean, it's like ripping out their innards. And um, uh, that's very alien to us. And then to do that in the name of profits or energy or whatever, things of that sort, it just feels um, sacrilegious. And that's hard, that's hard to understand. It's hard for, for us Westerners to really understand. We, we get it as a concept, but, it, but without connection to spirit, it doesn't get down here, which is where the, where the struggle is here. Yeah, it's that rational thinking. You know, you're making me think of something that Ed Casey wrote. I don't know if you know Ed, but he's a, a philosopher and he eco-psychologist. Uh, he, he's many things, I guess. Ed's a bit hard to explain, but he's a really profound thinker and writer. He has a great book called Getting Back Into Place, which I really love. And he talks a little bit about the Navajo in there. And it's probably something that you've heard and maybe that you know as well already. But he refers to how they call the land the great self. And, and, and in a sense, it's talking about what it's relating to what you're talking about. And that is that he said when they were displaced, which they were profoundly displaced when Kit Carson came along and there's the whole story about how they were moved forcibly off their lands and relocated several hundred miles away in, in what was called the, the long walk. And there, there's something that I read that really stayed with me. And he said that when that happened and those, the people were displaced from the land, that a lot of them actually just disappeared. Like they didn't die, they didn't, you know, he didn't have a, a description of where they went or what happened, but they just disappeared because when they lost that connection to land, they actually also lost themselves, literally. And, and I think that this is a, an interesting example of, of the, the style, the, the reciprocity versus the dominion. And it brings me back to this whole idea of progress. There's a word for you when you're speaking about language and a word that's really important in our Western modern culture. And, and that is that progress has to happen. At least we think that it has to happen from a corporate standpoint. And I spent many years in the corporate world myself. And from a, an ecological standpoint, we see that this is part of the, a big part of the problem because as long as companies continue to have to make those numbers and increase those numbers and build on those numbers year after year after year, we have to keep having more and improving things in our minds and you know there there's it makes you wonder where it's all going to stop because I can sit here and listen to you talking about how you know we need the reciprocity psyche and language and all of these things and I'm very aware of that and and I've had my own feelings of guilt about what I'm doing to the planet because I drive a car and because I buy things that are shipped over long distances and contributing to global warming and all that but it keeps coming back to me to wonder how we can actually turn the whole culture around because, and maybe it's not possible, I'm not even suggesting it is, but I wonder if you can say something about your vision of what needs to happen, even on an individual level, beyond just you know recycling or stop driving cars or driving electric cars, whatever it is, to, to be able to actually engage somehow in, even if it's just creating a container in which this kind of transition can actually take place. Uh, you, when you were talking just now, you used the phrase dominion versus reciprocity. 
and that's very common. It took a while for me to learn not to do that. Um, that's the binary. Yes. And as long as as long as we have a binary, there's a good and a bad. And the issue here is not either or, and there's not a good and a bad. There there is there is life and life is sacred there's not good life bad life it's life and it's all sacred and um so um the way i see it is an imbalance and we have the dominion psyche and the reciprocity psyche it's not versus it's again having this space so that there can be dialogue we need to have a reconnection with um, have the western psyche being reconnected to what i refer to on one paper is what, what i call the psyche left behind the psyche left behind was that psyche that was in the garden of eden where there was an at oneness and when we have that then there is an organic experience of the sanctity of life we can talk about it, but it's a concept. If, you, if, if we don't experience it, which is what's happening at Standing Rock, and that's the part that's not perceived, is for them, it is like wrenching out their heart and their guts. I mean, it is like that. And um, so, so what's needed is for these two to be in dialogue so that this dimension that is infused with spirit can introduce this the dominion psyche to it's really reintroduce to that spirit connection from which it became separated and is unawares that's kind of like the experience when I went out to Navajo first time. I was way over here somewhere. And um, fortunately for me, I had those unique experiences that happened. But when you have this, this dialogue, that's what right here, that's what I call borderland consciousness. And that's a new dimension. That's a third dimension now of consciousness that comes out of a connection, a, um, a, a linking. It's hard to find words in Western language to reflect uh, the spirit dimension. But I'll give you an example, because I, I think borderland consciousness, which is a collective phenomenon, an evolution, it, I see borderland consciousness as um, an evolutionary compensation for the over development of rational of the rational mind so that's what i call borderline consciousness and and i think it's it's happening very rapidly i think it's evolving very rapidly in the culture so an example of that is um oh gosh how many years ago now maybe maybe eight years something like that eight or nine years ago, the New York Times magazine. Now, New York Times is, you know, for a lot of people, is um, what a very sophisticated publication and would have very philosophical, analytical pieces and so forth. In their Sunday magazine, it was very startling to me. The cover story was about eight years ago was watching whales watching us now at the time that was published that was earth shaking we mean watching whales watching us what what what's being said there and there followed a, a series of other pieces along those lines and that uh, that article, which was a radical shift in focus, we could say consciousness, on the part of that publication, um, was the result of, of um, an emergent borderland consciousness 
that is bringing these two, dim two dimensions together. And since then, we've seen a lot. I mean, if you, if you reflect, if you notice um, every day, and I do mean every day, just living your life, going to the grocery store, what you see on the newspaper, what you hear people talking about on the street, if you're attuned to hearing reflections of borderland consciousness, is more and more appearing, coming out, being manifest in Western society, in Western culture. In 2000, 2012, 2011, something like that, there was an article on the front page of the LA Times. And the title of the article was, Nature Has Its Own Set of Rules. And, and that article was written by two scientists, and the theme of it was, essentially, they didn't say it quite this way, they said it almost this way, but not quite, is, hey, look, guys, fellow scientists and corporate folk and investors and corporations and whoever, if you think that we're going to save ourselves just by being smart with our science alone, you're mistaken. Nature has its own set of rules. And we can do a lot. And, what, and the tools that we have available to us through science and technology are indispensable, and they are indispensable. We won't survive without them. But if you think you're going to, to um, redress this and balance, with that alone, you're mistaken. Nature has its own set of rules. And in the age of the Anthropocene, uh, they, they use the term in that article, um, it's a term they use, uh, anthropocentrism. But they're talking about the same thing, which is the dominion psyche. <clears throat> if, if everything is going to be reduced to that, then we're doomed. These are scientists talking. And so the question, which is what my work is focused on, the question is, you raised it earlier, is how do we get that link and how do we get that connection from where I sit, what I see is that, is that the language limitations, um, the, the characteristics of oral traditional language which reflects that psyche and Indo-European language with all of its logos and abstraction, inherent in those languages is where the dissociation is. And that we have to find a way of taking some of these concepts of um, scientific concepts and reframing them, not changing them, but reframing them and the, the, the way I propose to do this is by literally taking those concepts and translating them through all traditional language. The languages I use are Hopi and Navajo. I, I don't speak either, but I work with uh, natives who are bilingual. And it's very interesting if in one of my papers, there was an op-ed piece by um, by a well-known MIT scientist, physicist, his name was Alan Lightman. And uh, he wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times about three, four years ago, um, where, and he, he essentially said the opposite of what I've been saying. He's saying, if you think you can save nature, forget it. Nature doesn't give a damn about us. And nature will take care of itself. We have to save ourselves. So, again, it's that split. And so we'll do what we have to do to the land pollution, uh, development of energy resources, all of that. And, and we'll just learn how to modulate it. And so 
one of the things I did was I took some quotes from that op-ed piece and I gave them to some of these uh, traditional natives that I work with and asked them to, to take that language and reframe it through um, oral traditional language structure. And it's very interesting what comes out. Now, we didn't get to the point of doing the final step, which is really the crucial step, which is to take those words that come out of your mouth, out of their mouth, take them back to the individual and to say, here's what you said as filtered through this psychic frame and to see what impact it has on them. And um, because there does need to be a way, there does need to be a way to experience. You can't just think it, it has to be organic, it has to be experienced, the reciprocity psyche. And then there is a basis for dialogue. I hope that makes sense. Uh, absolutely. It does to me, and some people might be hearing this for the first time, of course, this idea, some of these ideas are not as new to me because I, I sit with them a lot. And again, I mean, for me, it's, it's almost a daily dialogue that I engage in with myself and maybe whatever else is out there. But I think that it, what, what is becoming more and more clear to me is, you know, as, as overwhelmed as I get sometimes by everything that's going on and, and sometimes the despair comes through and hopelessness and the thought that, you know, we can never change and this is how it is and, and that we're heading for a big crash, all of that. I'm sure that a lot of us are really suffering almost on some level from some of those thoughts and ideas. But what I really take from what you're saying and this whole idea of the dialogue and the way that these two pieces work together and support each other, it's almost like a dance on some level. And, and I'm remembering a quote that Jung says, and I've used this a lot in my writing, I know you have as well. He says, nothing is holy any longer. Through scientific understanding, our world has become dehumanized. Our immediate communication with nature is gone forever. Now I have <laughs> questions about that. But he goes on to say, no wonder the Western world feels uneasy, for it does not know how much it has lost through the destruction of its numinosities. Its moral and spiritual tradition has collapsed and has left a worldwide disorientation and dissociation, which you've been talking about. And I think that this kind of profound sense of disorientation and of not being connected to something larger is really at the core of so much of that. And as we can begin to start noticing, as, as you say in your email, you have this aphorism that you always say, we, we see and we hear what we are open to noticing. And so for me, it becomes about that noticing and that is the way that we can start allowing those two different psyches as we view them to start coming into some dialogue. And, and space can be made for something new to emerge in that in that kind of place so as we wrap up here and and it's all gone so fast and there's just so much here that i think to be continued right because there, there's a lot to be said but i do want to tag one thing on to what you just said because you were quoting young and it was from his essay healing the split which was one of the last he wrote but uh in addition to that about three or four maybe five months before he died, in one of his last letters, he said, a letter to Miguel Serrano, he said what is needed in the Western world is a reality like that which I, Jung, experienced at Taos Pueblo. Now, Jung spent 24 hours total at Taos Pueblo, and that was the only interaction that he had with Native American, and he was so profoundly impacted by that that it changed his entire life, and that was one of the last statements he left as a legacy for us shortly before he died. So, so at some level, even though he couldn't fully articulate it, he never could name it beyond saying a re reality like that which I experienced at Taos Pueblo. That's as close as he got to naming it. But he knew it. He knew it. He felt it. And that was one of the last things he said. Yeah. Beautiful. 
Beautiful. Well, it's, it's very inspiring, all of it. Your work, Jerome, is just truly inspirational. And for me, it really provides a, a portal and an opportunity to reweave somehow ourselves back into this fabric of creation that we're all such an integral part of and, and to really foresee, you know, hope and, and change in, in ourselves first and individually and then, of course, in the collective as well. So, got one more thing I have to say. It takes the courage to speak what is not popular. And when you, when you began at the very beginning of this interview, you talked about legacy, your children and grandchildren. An experience I had, my grandchildren are um, 18, 20, 22. And I, um, this was a year ago, a year and a half ago, I took my two granddaughters, uh, my wife and I took her two granddaughters out to lunch. And, you know, they were, one was in high school, the other in college, and we were talking about all those things there important in their life. And then they, uh, one of them asked what I was doing and I said something about a talk I was giving on global climate change. And then I said, do you ever think about it? And the two of them nodded their heads and they started talking. I was really amazed what came out. What came out was exactly what you said at the beginning, despair. Um, in one case, hopelessness. I don't see how we're going to get out of this. Um, don't understand where it's going. And it surprised me. These are my own granddaughters. And, um, and I, the point is about borderline consciousness and being open. We, we see and hear what we are open to noticing, what we are open to noticing. We have to open ourselves. And that if we talk about this, that kind of experience comes, if you scratch the surface a little bit, out it comes. It's there. It's there. And it's there in language and emotions and feelings. And it's there in, in I've experienced this with scientists. If you scratch the surface and say, well, uh, what about spirit? Some of them run from the room screaming, but not many. Uh, we, we talk some, some roll their eyes, but it's there. We just need to have the courage to say what doesn't fit what we're used to. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And, you know, I'm very excited about the, the symposium to come. Of course, we're going to have lots of opportunities to bring community together in this format and be able to discuss further each of the topics as they come along in each of these interviews. And there's just so much rich wisdom and experience here. And I'm so excited to see what's to come. Jerome, I just thank you so much for being with me today. It's been just so wonderful. Thank you. And what you're doing is great. This <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Little scratch at a yes. time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, indeed. Well, thank you. And uh, just so that everybody knows, Jerome is going to be offering as his gift to you something to help further your understanding and further the work and further the conversation among all of us. And that is an article that's currently unpublished, I'm sure to be published at some point, called Dominion and Reciprocity, The Indigenous Mind and the Western Mind, What is Reality and What Difference Does It Make? And that is based on a, a recent presentation that he offered at the Union Society for Scholarly Studies. So really looking forward to sharing that with everybody. And you can find that by clicking the link that comes with this video. And thank you again, Jerome. I've been talking to Jerome Bernstein, who is a Union analyst and the author of the book, Living in the Borderland, The Evolution of Consciousness and the Challenge of Healing Trauma. So I encourage everybody to pick that up if you have not. Thank you, Jerome. For more information, visit www.depthpsychologyalliance.com. <laughs>